Hi, ladies and gents. One of the big questions back in the 1700s was, what exactly is the mass of the Earth? We didn't know. Now, Newton, Newton had determined his universal law of gravity, but the universal law of gravity contains two masses. So you have to know everything else really, really well before you can actually start massing the Earth. And one of the things we did not know is g. We did not know the universal gravitation constant. If you're going to use Newton's universal law of gravity, you always have to determine the gravitational force between two masses. Even today in astronomy, if we want to know the mass of a distant star, it's pretty easy to do if there are two stars. If one star is orbit, if you have two stars that are orbiting each other, essentially, um, then we can apply this law and determine their masses using some speed, time, and distance information. But you have to start out with a good value of g before that can even begun. So, 1700s. Here's the situation. Couldn't find the Earth because we did not have a good value of g. The gentleman who actually found the value for the universal gravitation constant was one of the most colorful scientists who ever lived. His name was Henry Cavendish, uh, 1700s to the early 1800s. He was actually the Duke of Devonshire. He was a very, very wealthy gentleman, painfully, painfully shy. Um, People, historians who look back at his life, suspect that he probably had some sort of a, a form of autism that made it him so shy and so socially uncomfortable. He could not teach to talk to women at all. Uh, he had housekeepers, and he would leave them notes and wouldn't look them in their eye. Um, when he went to scientific conferences, um, you couldn't talk directly to him. You had to sort of pose a question to the room, and, and Cavendish would answer the room, but he wouldn't talk directly to people. He, he was an unusual sort of fellow. He discovered hydrogen gas, and he originally called it a non-flammable gas. Well, if you know anything about hydrogen, it's extremely flammable. And he was testing its flammability. It blew up in his face and burned off his eyebrows and things like this, that it's going to happen if you do crazy stuff like that. Because of his incredible shyness, he wrote lots and lots of notebooks and papers and actually came up with things like Ohm's Law and Coulomb's Law and capacitance and a whole bunch of work on electricity, but he never published his ideas. And because of that, Cavendish didn't get credit in his lifetime. They actually later, the other people who published are the ones who actually got credit, even though he came up with these ideas first. So a kind of unusual, very, very colorful figure um, is the gentleman who found G. Now, Cavendish didn't want anybody borrowing his equipment or his library or his library book, so he actually built a workshop that was about four miles from his home, and it was sort of a secret workshop, and he would walk the four miles to his workshop every day to go work in his laboratory. He constructed an incredibly elegant experiment to calculate G. What he did was, in his workshop, he suspended a thin wire. And the very first thing he did with that thin wire is he did some experiments how much force was required to twist the wire through a variety of angles. And he did that over and over and over again until he could graph it and he got some very accurate numbers, exactly how much force is required to twist this wire a certain amount. So that's what we refer to as a torsion fiber. Then what he did is he had two small masses and two large masses. Now these are not large masses. These are under about 10 kilograms, meaning they're about 22, 23 pounds. And he wanted to measure the force of gravity between them. Because Newton's law of gravity, he knew mass one, he knew mass two, he could experimentally find the force of gravity. He could vary the distance between the objects. And the only thing that he was then missing was g. He worked on this for years and years and years. Um, and he actually took his data from outside the building and looked through a telescope to see 
the actual readings on the torsion balance, why did he work from outside the building? Because of the fact he was a smart man and he knew that his mass would affect the force of gravity on these objects. The value he got for the universal gravitation constant is so good that it is within 1% of the modern value of that number. Considering that this was over 200 years ago, it's very impressive science. But now that we have that number, we can calculate the mass of the Earth. So let's do that. So the force of gravity is going to be equal to g mass 1 mass 2 over the distance between them, their centers squared. Now we have another equation for force of gravity, and that is mass times acceleration of gravity. So I can replace on this side Fg with mass times acceleration of gravity, and by the 1700s, acceleration of gravity was very well known. G, mass 1 and mass of the Earth. Now, what is mass 1? Mass 1 here could be anything. It could be something like a 1 kilogram mass, something that's just a standard. Um, it could be the mass of a puppy, mass of a person, and it doesn't really matter because what's going to happen with those masses? That mass is going to drop out of the equation. And I'm going to end up with g is going to be equal to the acceleration of gravity times the radius squared, and I'm not looking for g, whoops, sorry, bad algebra, mass of the Earth is going to be equal to the acceleration of gravity times the radius squared divided by big G. Well, the acceleration of gravity, 9.80 meters per second squared. Radius of the Earth, 6.37 times 10 to the sixth meters. 6.672 times 10 to the negative 11th Newton meter squared kilogram squared. And when you throw that in your calculator, I got out 5.96 times 10 to the 24th kilogram. And that was the first time that we were actually able to mass the Earth. And once we have massed the Earth, well, then we can calculate the mass of the Sun. And once you have the mass of the Sun, you can calculate Mercury and Venus and Jupiter and Saturn and so forth. All right, we will see you next time.